We are in session three. Actually, we're in session four. We're on page 13, which says session three. So, <clears throat> we're talking about the last great revival. It's always a topic that comes up in Christian meetings. And we're going to look at how this applies or comes together with dominion. <clears throat> well, the way it ties together is very simple. Your end time viewpoint will affect the dominion life. How you see all of this playing out will determine actually how uh, you will apply dominion or not. And we talked about a little bit here. So first we say we must make sure that we do not allow our end time viewpoint to somehow short circuit the plan of God for our life. <clears throat> there are many end time viewpoints. So far, none of them have been proven right. Right? Remember that. Okay? So... It's very easy to teach on something that you can't prove one way or the other. Okay? <clears throat> Many cults were started by emphasizing a particular end-time view. Throughout history, religious groups have been sounding the it's the end of the world alarm. Right? Now, we have to differentiate between it's the end of the world to the last days. Okay? It is the last days. We know that from Scripture. Uh, <clears throat> now, the end of the world, that's a whole different thing. Okay? First off, some have sold everything and gone to the hills to await the end. Okay, you say, who are you talking about? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses did that in 19, 1914, 1917, I think it was, and then again in 1976. Uh, you can see all through history, uh, every time they get a word somewhere, somebody will say that's the end or the end's coming next year. They'll sell everything they got, run up on the hills and wait on top of a hill and watch for Jesus to come. And then a little while they're back down on their relative's doorstep knocking and asking for food. Aww. So, <clears throat> some have even taken the lives of their followers and convinced them, or convinced them, to take their own lives. And that goes along with the Heaven's Gate cult that was out and some of these others that were there. I didn't mention the, the Millerites. They also did the same thing. There's been several groups throughout history. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just pointing out you can do some research and you'll find these people. Usually it's not so drastic that they end up killing people or taking their own lives but it will tend to cause one to behave in a certain way. Now, <clears throat> notice the big letters on the next page. Okay? It's not because, as, see, one day if somebody got a hold of this, they'd say, oh, look, look what large letters Curry wrote with. He must have had an eye problem. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's because too many Christians apparently have eye problems because they can't see to read the Bible, and so we have to tell them from the beginning, just because I mentioned the following, it does not mean that I am for or against either position. Right? Are we clear on that? Right? So when we get done here, you still won't know, won't know which position I'm for or against. Amen? That's the whole, that's the whole idea. Okay? Now, <clears throat> so please note that there are many positions held within the quote-unquote rapture camp. I'm, and again, even the way I wrote this was I, I took this from writings from different groups. So it wasn't even my wording here. There is, number one, a traditional rapture view. Uh, and the result, now notice, I, I go through both sides of this. Result should be a zeal and urgency to reach the world with the gospel. Right? The people that believe, and I, when I say the people, you notice I'm being very vague about it. I'm not saying we, us, them. I'm not using any of those terms. Okay, I'm saying whoever believes a rapture view, that, the, that viewpoint should cause people to want to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Amen? Should, that should be the natural result. Now, B, the result tends to be laziness. As long as the person is convinced that they're part of the group that's going to be raptured. Right? Now, if they don't think they're part of that group and they have to uh, work their way into that group, then they tend to get busy. Amen? And many times you can even see that, that they are actually working, trying to work their way toward either heaven as a whole or to be included in the rapture or something. Jehovah's Witnesses do that. That's one of the reasons why they go door to door. They're told to, and they believe that they get points for it. Basically, I don't want to say points, but they believe that, uh, like many Christians, they believe that, what, that their works are going to get them there. Right? <clears throat> now, I'm not, again, just picking on them. It's just one of the groups that I tend to know a little bit about. So... <clears throat> C, okay, so the, re the result tends to be uh, 
that people get lazy, and that's only because they think they're in the group, right? That is going. If they're not in the group, they tend to get very busy trying to work their way into the group, okay? C, the teaching itself tends to produce people that do not care about earthly things, okay? How many know that's a plus, right? Because they say it's all going to burn. Maybe not the best reason, <laughs> okay? So, again, I'm not trying to get into an in-depth teaching on this. I'm just showing in dealing with Christians, this is what we have encountered, right? Now, let's look at the other side. And I should say that, uh, just as I said in the beginning, that there are diff many different positions held by people in the rapture camp because there's, uh, you know, pre-trib, rapture, mid-trib, post-trib, no-trib. I mean, you name it. There's all kinds of camps, and everybody's got their own little group, right? And they say that, that that's when it's going to happen, or a partial rapture, or total rapture. I mean, it's just a bunch of different things. Now, point two is generally called the no rapture view. And you would also note at the beginning, it says that there are many positions held in the no rapture camp, just like there are in the rapture camp, right? <clears throat> the result uh, of the no rapture view, in other words, here, here's the essential thing. <clears throat> many people will look and say, okay, the rapture is going to take us out of here. So yes, we should witness. Yes, we should do these things. But, and at any moment, we're going to be raptured out. So we should be busy, and then we're going to be raptured out so that we don't face the wrath and all the stuff that's going to happen on the world. Then there's the other group. Remember, there's lots of camps in that group. Uh, but then there's a group that says, oh, nope, there's not going to be a rapture. Rapture isn't in the Bible. The word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, neither is the word trinity. Okay, so, okay. But it's actually in the Latin version uh, of the Bible. But uh, when they say there's not going to be any rapture, usually those people are somewhere in the, along the lines of uh, we're going to keep, uh, because of the parables Jesus gave, we're going to keep working and advancing the kingdom until the kingdom covers the whole earth. And eventually, when it's covered the whole earth, then Jesus will come back and reign and there's no rapture at all involved. Right? The, now these are, please understand, this is not a... a an end time teaching, all right? I'm just giving you a real quick update, kind of giving you a real broad general idea, okay? So please don't base your beliefs on anything I've just said because I haven't given you enough information to choose either side, all right? So I'm just trying to bring you up to date on some of these things. Now, the result of the no rapture view should be a serious, systematic evangelistic program. If that group believes that nothing's going to happen until the world is covered and all of this happens, then we should systematically be working toward uh, making sure the earth has, the whole earth has heard the gospel, right? If we have to bring it, uh, have to take it to the ends of the earth and everything, you know, various scriptures that say that, then we should be busy doing that and it should be a systematic thing, not just a hit and miss, uh, you know, left to people doing it as they, uh, will, so to speak. B, the results, okay, now we'd say what the results should be. The results tend to be or to produce a laziness in its proponents due to the idea that there is an indefinite or undefined time period in which they have to work. When, when you don't put a timeline on something, you don't put a time limit, people tend, especially if it's over the course of generations, people tend to get lazy, right? Funny thing is, both sides of this count when people say, uh, well, you know, we've heard about it from the beginning. Still hadn't happened, so, you know, probably won't. And they said that's what the scoffers in the last days are going to say, right? So there are whole groups that say along these lines. Now, uh, because they don't have an idea of when this is supposed to be wrapped up, they tend to not think long term, really, and they just go about living life. So, uh, C... It tend, now, here's one of the, the positives of this side, is that it tends to produce people that believe they are to work to advance the kingdom. Now, whether they work systematically or work together, uh, not so much, okay? But those are kind of both sides, again, very general, so please don't take this as our stance on end times, all right? Now, page 15, B we have talked about a worldwide saints movement, right? We were even calling it the Dominion Life Saints movement because what we've seen, and, and I, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail on this, but we saw all 
well, most people would say five-fold ministry out of Ephesians 4, the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Uh, in the Greek, it literally says the apostle, prophet, evangelist, and a pastor who teaches, right? That's why you don't see a lot of reference to pastors in the rest of the scripture, but you see a lot of reference to teachers because they are teachers who pastor, okay? Or pastors who teach. But a pastor uh, will always have a teaching aspect of his ministry, and a teacher should have a pastoral or a fathering aspect of his life. Right? It should be both sides of that. Now, uh, we've seen all of these four, five groups now restored. We started seeing it with the teaching movement that started back in the 70s, even the late 60s into the 70s, and then more into the uh, evangelistic area, or the re restoration, as we would call it, of the evangelist, where we're seeing mass evangelism around the world, uh, major crusades with sometimes over a million people in the crusade, and that was whenever the evangelist was starting to function as a biblical evangelist, not just as a, a preacher, but also one that had signs and wonders following, and that's where you saw the big meetings, and we saw some of the early ones even in people like Tommy Hicks down in South America, uh, Reinhard Bonnke over in Africa. You've got people all over uh, with different aspects of um, large ministries like that that was primarily evangelistic. <clears throat> then we started seeing the pastoral ministry restored, and we started seeing the, the rise of mega churches. So all these churches started coming up, and they were huge, and sometimes have 10, 15, 20, 30, 40,000 people as members of a church. And there was one pastor who was overseeing that, but he would have an army of under shepherds, so to speak, that also helped him. And the, the churches that, that uh, really functioned and stayed were the ones that were able, that the pastor was able to shift from a shepherd mentality of having to deal with each person to more of what is generally called a rancher type of mentality. Um, a shepherd knows the sheep by name and, and functions with each one. And if they're missing, they know who's missing. If there's an empty seat, they know who sits there, that kind of thing. Uh, but with mega churches, they, they weren't pastors in the sense of shepherds like that. They became more like ranchers that had herds of cattle mm -hmm. and they had to have many uh, ranch hands help them herd the cattle, right? I hate that analogy, but it's honestly pretty accurate. And so uh, they had to move to that and then it's funny because some people say, well, I don't want to go to that church. It's so small. I don't want to go there. And then you got other people say, that church is so big. I don't know anybody. And I, so, you know, it's just the fickleness of people. Uh, but then whenever the, some of these mega churches started putting into place uh, what they would call lay pastors and lay ministers, then they would break them into smaller groups. And that way they had the best of both worlds for the most part. Uh, and this has nothing to do with the teaching that's going on. I'm talking about just the ministries that were being seen. Then after that, we started seeing uh, the introduction of the prophetic ministry. This was in the 80s into the 90s. We started seeing it. And usually each one of these uh, moves, if you want to call it that, uh, lasts about 20 years. And that's even with some overlap at the beginning and the end of the next move that's coming. Now, God did not move from teaching to pastors, or I'm sorry, teachings to evangelists to pastors. God was, what his idea was, even though man didn't, necessarily work with it, was that the, we see the teaching aspect, which is important, and then you see the, past, the uh, evangelists come in on top of that, and then the pastors, so he was rebuilding the church from the ground up, so to speak, and man was, now understand, God was not restoring it, man was awakening to it, right? You see the difference. It wasn't that we were waiting on God to give it, is that God was waiting on man to wake up and go, oh, we should be having this going on, and so then God starts to move in their midst. So then uh, we started seeing the, the prophetic movement. And with every one of these moves in the beginning, there's truth given. And then you have people that run to extremes. And then eventually it kind of whittles down and comes back to a normal. You know, it's kind of like it comes, it comes out then it goes from one side to the other, swings from one ditch to the other. And then eventually it tends to come back to the middle, which is where the Bible actually tells you how to walk it. <clears throat> we see the same thing with the prophetic. Everybody, and with every move, uh, whoever was a pastor, all of a sudden now they're a prophet. Why? Because it's the next thing, and people see it as a higher rung, so they want to move up to that, so they claim to be a prophet, even if they're not. Uh, and so you can, you can see that in a lot. But um, in the prophetic, the prophetic was one of the easiest moves uh, that 
When I say easiest, what I mean is it was the easiest to fabricate. It was the easiest to say anything. And it didn't matter what you said, and it didn't matter. There was no accountability, and you could make everything, oh, well, that was a word. I had a word from the Lord, and you could say anything you want, and there was nobody around to hold it, you know, hold you to it, right? And it's funny, too, because I was thinking about this the other day that, you know, we talk about in the Old Testament, well, in the Old Testament, if a prophet says something didn't come to pass, you stone him. Well, how long does it take to come to pass? Because Isaiah prophesied some things 700 years before Jesus actually showed up. So if they'd have been looking at that for the next, you know, five years and said, well, you know, this Messiah you're talking about hadn't showed up yet, they could have stoned him for being a false prophet because it didn't happen overnight. So there's a whole lot of area in there that we need to look at sometimes when people say like, oh, it didn't come to pass. Don't listen to him. Well, it didn't come to pass when? Your timing or God's timing? Uh -huh. See? So there's a lot of things. Again, grace. You got to give people grace to grow. Do you want to stone a prophet? Okay, well, first of you that uh, has no sin, you throw the first stone. There you go. And so we need to start to give people grace. Now, on the, on the other side of it, we are to judge it. And if someone makes a proclamation and you know, says something like, uh, well, by next Monday, then this is going to happen. Well, if Monday comes and it doesn't happen, then there you go. That's pretty obvious, right? Um, but the bad part is even the uh, wolves have learned how to manipulate that system and come in and fleece the sheep and try to say things and pro, you know, promise them anything uh, and, and get an offering and then leave town before any of it has a chance to come to pass or not come to pass. And so we have to be wise to these things. That's why uh, back in the early days of the church, they actually had some rules that they went by. And there was one uh, called the Didache, which means the teaching of the Twelve. And in that, they actually say, if someone comes to your city and, and claims to be a prophet, or actually there's two different sections, one says, uh, if, you, if someone comes to your city and stays for more than three days, uh, comes in and he stays for more than three days, then after the third day, tell him to get a job. We'll, we'll support him for the first three days. After that, tell him to get a job. Right? And so that's how they handled things, because they had people that would travel around and just come in and live off of the people. And then there's actually another one, which I found amazing. Uh, it, it should be reenacted and put back in the church. It says, if somebody comes in, and listen to this. This was, this was passed around. It's, it's not Bible, okay? But it was the teaching of the early church, and it was passed around. It was common. It was commonly accepted, right? So it, this is how they did things. It was rules they set up. They said if a person comes into your midst and claims to be a prophet and supposedly under the unction of the Spirit uh, asks for money, then cast him out because he's a false prophet. Right? And if the church would just take that one rule and put it back in place, yeah, things would, have, things would change. Amen? It, it would, it, you'd see some, uh, I don't know, some intelligence and integrity come back into the church. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's some of these old things are kind of good to go back and look at. So, and then, after the prophetic, and like I said, there's extremes on both sides, and then after that, we started seeing the re, more or less the, uh, how do I say that, well, the restoration of the apostolic. And then all of a sudden, everybody that was a pastor, that had became a prophet, now they all want to be apostles. And so you can see it. They just keep trying to move up the ladder, so to speak. And they don't realize that the apostles, according to the apostle Paul, um, is not like the apostles in the church today, generally, because the apostle Paul, he said, he set forth us apostles last. And he said that we are the off scouring of the earth. In other words, we're not the ones that show up in the, in the you know, six door limousines and get dropped off and have 15 people carrying your bags and your Bibles and all that kind of stuff while you come in in some $10,000 Armani suit, right? Uh, Paul said, you don't understand. He said, you want to see my credentials? Because some people were writing to him. I was going to, I should have, maybe, yeah, I don't know. I might have it here. Uh, the, all of the accusations made against Paul, you ever just read a list of them sometime. They just I have a book that they actually just lined them out and it's really pretty good. Um, but, they said, well, he's not even a real apostle. Look at him. He, if he was a real apostle, he would have done this, and he wouldn't have done this, and he wasn't that, and all this. And, and they said, well, uh, the apostle Paul can't be a true apostle because he doesn't even keep his word. He said he was going to come visit us, and he didn't. And so if your travel plans change because God tells you to go a different way, all of a sudden now you're not a real apostle. No, you are if you listen to God. Right? And, but even like today, you, know, you make plans to go somewhere, and something, yeah, in a sense, something of God comes up. 
and you end up going somewhere else, uh, then all of a sudden you're not a man of your word. Well, you got to decide which is which. And uh, when we were in, we first actually started traveling full time. Uh, Benny Hinn and uh, Steve Hill. Y'all know who that is? Y'all know who I'm talking about? All right. Both of them had Bible schools, one right here in Dallas area, uh, and then one out on the West Coast. And they both invited me to preach in their Bible school and come teach what we were teaching in their Bible school. Now, how many of you know that would have been a, from all natural viewpoints, that would have been an amazing thing, would have been good to get it into those schools. Mm -hmm. Amen? Uh, the only one problem, they said, here's the dates that are open. And I already had a commitment to go to other churches on those <coughs> dates. And they wanted me to basically bail on them. Well, they didn't say that. They, they said, see if you can work it out where you can come to our school instead. And we'd already promised these people would be at their church. One church had 50 people, another one had maybe 150. And here you had these two major ministries that invited us, and they expected us to just ditch these smaller churches and go to them because it would have been good for us if we'd have done so. And so we called them back and told them, uh, I've already got dates planned for that date. I can ask those people if they want to change the date, great. But if they don't, that's where I'm going. And so, it, to be honest with you, we didn't even call and ask them. And so we ended up going to these two smaller churches. And it was the only opportunity I ever got from them. It's the only time I ever got invited. And so, uh, but the thing is, if you give your word, you stick to it. Right? And you don't ditch uh, a smaller church to go to a bigger one just because it's a bigger opportunity or in many cases, a bigger offering. Right? God is in charge of your offering. Right? Whether you get it right then or he brings it to you later, that's God. Amen? Amen? And you don't just go after a big name or something like that just for a photo opportunity. So <clears throat> that's what um, they were talking about, Paul, in trying to bring that across to him. Well, there has to be, uh, in this apostolic restoration, there was a, a move towards certain things, and each one of these brought in certain DNA. We actually taught about all this in the apostolic alignment teaching. I don't know if you've seen that or not. I don't know if we have it out there or not, but you can get it. We do have it, and it was just a couple of days teaching we did down in Austin, Texas, not too long ago, or a couple of years ago now, I guess. <clears throat> but we talk about how all of these are aligning back up and the purpose of it, and that you need that DNA of each of these ministries in every local body of Christians. And so... Uh, we talk about that. Well, the Dominion Life Saints movement, I say we've had, as you would say, four or five movements so far. And all of these, you'll notice those are all out of Ephesians chapter 4. But Ephesians chapter 4, the, the four slash five fold ministry, was for the purpose of training the saints. So it wasn't about restoring, and everybody said, oh, this is it, the restoration of the apostle. No, all those were restored so that all of those could be put into the saints so that the last would be the saints movement that has all of these DNA in them. They'll have the, the, the founding of the word from the teacher. They'll have the pastoral oversight, the, the love of the father for the people to father them and, and to uh, raise them up. They will have the aspect of the evangelist to be able to reach out and, and bring people into the kingdom. They will have the prophetic dimension so that they can be able to uh, direct according to the spirit of God and speak into people's lives, but mainly help uh, churches go where they need to go. And then, of course, the apostolic has the, the what, what we generally call the go spirit, the militant, uh, kind of a militancy uh, that, that says we're taking new lands for Christ. We're not stopping. We're not letting any, anything stop us. And you move into these things. So you need all five of those in the saints so that there could be a saints movement that goes out in the power that all of these others have. So that was the purpose for it. Now, the last great revival will be a saints movement, right? Now, the thing is, what do you mean by last great revival? Well, last kind of speaks for itself. And great, well, that's all a matter of how you see it. That's a viewpoint. Because right now, uh, any meeting, almost, almost any meeting where people are saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, is a better meeting than, that, than what was held in the early Pentecostal movement. In the early Pentecostal movement, if there was five people that got saved, they call that a revival, literally, right? If, you know, two people got healed, they wrote in newspaper articles and sent it in to all the uh, Pentecostal magazines of the day and would be talking about every detail of how this person's rheumatism was healed, right? And today, that wouldn't even bring notice on most of the 
email uh, newsletters and things that you get. Why? Because we're so much used to other things now because now the, the church hasn't moved backward. Okay? It, it started great in the, church, in the book of Acts, went so far, hit up to about you know, 11, 12, 1300 years, 1400 years, then went into the dark ages. And then that's when it started backing up. And then after that, in, uh, in the 1500s, you had Martin Luther say, you know what, I think that the just shall live by faith, according to the Bible. And it shook the whole world. And so he decided to break away and to stick with the truth he found. And because of that, uh, the church started coming back up out of the pit. And it's been a forward motion since then. And then in the 1700s, you had John Wesley, great revivals. In the 1800s, you had William Booth, again, great revivals. And Booth came out of Wesley's uh, Methodist movement. And then in the eight, late eight, or mid to late 18, or no, I'm sorry, early 1800s, you had um, Charles Finney, tremendous revivals right here in America. And then from that on into the early 1900s when the Pentecostal outpouring started. And you have to remember, before 1901, all of those great revivals were marked by signs and wonders, but they never tied speaking in other tongues with what is called the baptism of the Spirit. They had all the stuff that's going on. People spoke in tongues, uh, healings, miracles, all that was going on. They just didn't tie it together as a doctrine. Then in 1901, we saw a new fresh, uh, seemed like a fresh outpouring. Started in Topeka, Kansas, 1901. Came down to Texas. From Houston went to Azusa Street out in Los Angeles. And from Azusa Street went all over the world. And so it started the modern Pentecostal movement or spirit-filled century is what they were calling it. And during that time now, all of a sudden, we see this massive movement to where people are getting saved, and it, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And now we have, now we fill stadiums. And used to, the people that, got, that started speaking in tongues, they would get kicked out of the regular churches. If you spoke in tongues, they'd kick you out. Many of them said, oh, that's of the devil. And they'd run them out. And now they're the only groups that fill stadiums. What? They're the only ones that have the signs and wonders that verify the power of the Spirit working in them to any large degree, and they are, they are the ones that have changed the world. The Azusa Street Revival was one of the 100 top events in history according to secular uh, historians. Now think about that. So all these things are going on. Now in that, now the idea and, and the problem is going to be this. We are training saints to do the work of the ministry. We're teaching them how to step up and have to do the work. The problem is people get bored doing the same thing every day, even if the same thing is miracles. We see it all the time. We see people have great testimonies, write in uh, reports, talking about healings, talking about miracles, dead raisins. I mean, you name it. It's going on all the time. And then in a couple of months, you don't hear from them. And when you contact them, oh, yeah, well, we just kind of got busy and, you know, nothing was really happening. Really? I thought you had a dead raisin a month ago. Well, yeah, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, uh, she, she's still, you know, or actually one of the letters we got. Um, yeah, actually, uh, two people that have been raised from the dead. Uh, now they, they went back in the world, not even part of the church. Yeah. Why? Because people get bored doing the same thing. That's one of the keys. See, here, here's one aspect of Jesus that every Christian is going to have to get. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Right? If you don't get that, you'll probably fall away. At least at some point, you'll be fluctuating and you won't keep walking. Right? You have to realize what you do today, if what you're doing is right, you need to do every day for the rest of your life. Amen? It's just like I don't know, exercise or taking vitamins or anything else. Uh, you know, you don't get down and do one push-up and go, oh, okay, we're, <laughs> we're good. Don't ever have to do that again, thank God. No, that's not the way it works. Right? That's not the way it works. So, now, so, this movement of saints that are going to change the world, literally, are going to be people who do the same thing day in and day out. They're going to do the same thing when it's exciting and when it's not exciting. Why? Because it's truth and because God said do it. Amen? That's really, that's why I don't go after, uh, you know, phenomena. I don't go after all these things that, that seem to draw so many people. Why? Because those things come and they pass. And if you're led by those things, then you'll come and you'll pass. And you'll just fade away. 
But if you go, if you just be a good soldier, in your hardness, do the same thing every day, keep showing up and keep on going, then things will get better and better and better. And they keep on growing. And everybody will wonder how you do it. And they'll, because they just find out about you. You've been doing it 15 years. They just find out and think, wow, you must have got here overnight. Nope. You know, well, I've been looking for you all my life. We haven't been looking too hard. We've been right here. Right? <laughs> and so, now, there are many people that hold various positions of the end times, as stated previously, even in how things are to be wrapped up in the last days. One thing is certain. We are in the last days. Okay? <clears throat> These last days have already lasted over 2,000 years. In Acts 2.14, it says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in these last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let's look at a couple of things here. First off, he says in verse 16, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It will come to pass in the last days. And this was in, on the day of Pentecost. So we know that's when the last days started, or at least it was during that time period. <clears throat> and God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then he says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. Then he says, and all my servants. Now notice, he's talking about sons and daughters, right? And upon all flesh. Then he says, and all my servants and handmaidens. So now he's showing a, distinct, a, a distinction. In other words, the Spirit's going to be poured out upon all people, but not everybody's going to take it. It's being poured out upon all. And he said, no, notice, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, so they're going to get it. They're going to get a hold of it. But then he says, on my servants and the handmaidens, I'll pour it in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. So now he's talking about distinction between the whole, all the earth, all flesh, and servants and handmaidens. Notice he didn't just say people, you know, people that had happened in. Servants and handmaidens, right? Now notice what he said in verse 19. Now from verse, up from verse, um, sorry, verse 14 to verse 18, all that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, right? It was being fulfilled right then. I mean, nobody had had dreams or visions yet, I guess, under that outpouring, but it was coming to pass at that moment. But now notice, verse 19, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Okay, nobody's seen that. That hadn't happened yet, no, I mean, then. You get that? None of that had happened, okay? The sun shall be turned into darkness. Well. You could say that happened at Jesus' crucifixion. That might have been, which would have been technically the moment when the last days started. Okay? And the moon into blood. Okay? Uh, no sign of that at that point. So here he is quoting Joel, the prophet. And he says, all this is going to happen, and this is that. But then it's as if he jumps forward and says, and this is how it's going to be all ended. In other words, I'm going from the beginning to the end. And just like Isaiah, Isaiah saw the, both the suffering Messiah and the conquering Messiah. He saw both. But he didn't know how to put them together, and he didn't know how much time was going to be between each. So whenever the Jews saw the scriptures that talked about the Messiah coming, all they ever talked about was him coming uh, to set them free. So they didn't see the suffering part. Right? And so they only saw what they saw, and they didn't see the suffering, which is one of the reasons why they didn't accept Jesus. But go on, because he didn't ride in on a white horse and conquer the, the Romans. And so <clears throat> instead they said, well, that couldn't be him because he's dead now. And they didn't see that part. So they kept looking forward to, where, to his return. And so whenever Joel is talking about this, we have to make sure that we don't 
put the two together and, we, and that we recognize that there was a time between the two that we are now living in, right? So he prophesied the beginning and he prophesied the end. It's the same thing Jesus did. Jesus operated the same way. When he talked about Lazarus, he said, this sickness will not end in death. Well, he didn't say he wasn't going to die. He just said, oh, here's the end. God's going to be glorified because this sickness won't end in death. And yet people saw that and they go, okay, well, good. Then he's going to be okay. No, nope, he's dead. <laughs> I thought you said it wouldn't end in death. Well, it ain't over yet. Right? And so Jesus did the same thing. He saw the, the now and he prophesied the end, but they didn't see the in-between. Always remember, usually when you're given a prophetic word, the word will come when there's great peace. And you'll think, what does that mean? And you'll try to put all kinds of different things to it. And you, it doesn't always tell you the, the distance of time between the time you receive the word and the time it's fulfilled. But usually before it's fulfilled, all hell breaks out. Right? And then when you're right in the middle of all the trouble and you're thinking, God, where are you? Then he reminds you of the word that he gave you before you were in the trouble. And then he says, don't worry, this is the way it's going to be. Right? And that should give you comfort so you can go, you know what? God knew this. He knew it ahead of time. He's with me. And so for th guess what? All this trouble, it, it, this ain't the end. Right? The end will be after this passes because he's already told me what the end's going to be. And this ain't it. Right? So if, if this ain't the end, then don't get hung up over this. You understand that? So remember, that's what he did with Joshua. That's what he did all the way through. So just because you get a word doesn't mean everything's going to be great right up to it. It usually means he's giving you a word because you're going to need it to war a good warfare so that you can accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. Usually means, and I'll tell you this, the greater the word, usually the greater the battle before the word comes to pass. So when people get these great prophecies and they're all excited and they write them down and tell everybody, yeah, hide and watch. Okay, watch their lives, watch what happens. Because usually the greater the prophecy, the greater the trouble there was. What? Because if God has to bring mighty power to deliver you, it's because you're in mighty big trouble. Okay, that's usually the way it works. If you remember that, then whenever the trouble comes, you'll go, oh man, this is going to be good, this is going to be glorious. And people look at you and think, you are crazy, this ain't glorious, look at this. You go, oh no, you don't understand. As bad as it's going to get, the deliverance is going to be greater. And you start looking at that, and then all of a sudden it starts getting good. Amen? It's kind of like the guy that heard somebody quote him the other day, but he quoted wrong. Uh, he gave the wrong person that said it. But um, there was a person that said, uh, they said, well, how are you doing? And he said, ah, it's perfect. It's great. We're surrounded. The enemy's on all sides. <laughs> and they said, well, what do you mean it's great? Well, we can shoot anywhere and hit him. <laughs> right? So we, we said, we can't miss him now. And so we need, we need to realize that's how we need to be. When we're in the middle of trouble, realize, guess what? God just brought the enemy into sight, so no matter where you hit, you're going to hit something. Amen. Amen. So, now, he goes on, and he talks about, now notice this last part, verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, automatically, there is nothing in the Bible that says that the word saved, used here, always refers to salvation in the sense of eternal destiny. Right? Look up the word saved. It has a whole range of things. It can mean healed, delivered. It can mean even having peace brought to you. It can mean all kinds of things. It just means whatever situation you're in, you'll come out of. Right? It does not mean always, in every case, it does not mean go to heaven or eternal life. You get that? When people read this, they automatically think it means eternal life. It doesn't always. You have to read it in context of what's going on. Now, if a person is drowning and you pull them out of the water, you've saved them, right? It doesn't mean they're going to heaven. Matter of fact, they might have gone to heaven if you hadn't have saved them, <laughs> right? You understand? So, anyway, <clears throat> so what we have to realize <clears throat> is that whenever we look at being saved, we have to realize what that means is to be saved, brought out of, or something out of the situation. If you look at the context here, because many people have taken the word saved when they say this word. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They say, oh, see, all you got to do is call on the name of the Lord. If you just call on the name, you're in. That's it. Okay, that goes against everything Jesus said. Jesus said, you want to be, be my disciple? You cannot be my disciple unless you take up your cross. Isn't that right? He said, you cannot be my... You ought to go through and read how many people cannot be Jesus' disciple. 
He didn't make it easy. See, we had this idea. Well, if you just call on his name, that's it. No, no. Calling on his name means he will help you out of that situation. Doesn't mean eternal life. Right? When he says here, notice what's going on. I'll show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor, smoke, sun will return to darkness, moon into blood, right? Before the great noble day of the Lord come, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, first off, they were talking mainly to Jewish people at that time, and all these things were going to be coming on them, right? And all he's saying is, if you will listen, and whenever you start seeing these things happen, what did Jesus say? So when you start seeing the armies compass about Jerusalem, run to the hills. Isn't that what he said? And do you know in 70 AD, whenever, uh, was it Tatian, I think it was, uh, invaded Rome? Uh, that whenever he, or uh, invaded Rome, I don't know if he had invaded Rome. When he invaded Jerusalem, uh, they, they knew about it. The, the Roman army surrounded or had most of Jerusalem surrounded for two months before they actually closed the gap and nobody else could leave or you know, come in or go. And so they had it almost surrounded. And the Christians, remembering what Jesus said, when they said, when you see the armies compass about, run to the hills, all the Christians left Jerusalem. And whenever Rome conquered Jerusalem, killed the Jews, tore down the temple, stone upon stone, where nothing uh, stood, nothing remained, okay? The Christians remember that. They left. Whenever the Romans took over and went in there, there was not one Christian killed in the siege of Jerusalem. Why? Because Jesus prophesied it, they remembered it, and they left. Right? Now, what did they do? They called on the name of the Lord, and they were delivered from the situation. That does not mean that they had eternal life. Right? Eternal life comes by being his disciple. You get that? So you can call. How many people do you know? <clears throat> Your heathen relatives, okay, that have some horrible thing happen, and they call on the name of the Lord, and the Lord delivers them, and as soon as the trouble passes, they go right back. They didn't get saved. They didn't get saved for eternity. You understand? They were brought out of the situation. So just because it says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved, does not mean eternal life. Right? Eternal life comes by being in Christ, not by just calling on His name. His name is not some magic charm. Right? It's not an incantation or something. You come into Him, and it's no longer He that, or you that live, but He that lives in you. Amen? In Christ is the only place. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Notice the righteous run in. You get that? So if your heart is toward God, you're unsaved, but you run in, you're counted righteous. You got that? Okay. Enough of that. Let's keep going. Y'all get anything out of this? Okay. Now, go with me to the next page. Some camps believe that there will be a great falling away while other camps believe there will be a great harvest. Yeah. So as usual, you know, there's the old saying, if you had three Jew, or if you had two Jews, you had three opinions. Right? That's an old saying. Well, it's the same thing in the church. Right? If you got two Christians, you got three opinions. Okay? So it's, it's the whole thing goes all the way. The Bible speaks of both. Okay? And it's up to the Bible reader to decide which is right and what happens and in which order. Most of the time, I just think about something I've studied just recently. Most of the time, it's up to you to be able to take all of this stuff and lay it out and see where it fits together, right? If you just listen to somebody tell you what it's going to be, you're probably going to be wrong. Why? Because the majority has never been right, okay? One of, just a basic way, I think, that it, when I hear uh, all of these people coming out with the same uh, revelation, Okay, number one, they didn't all come out with it. One person came out with it. The others heard it and they started repeating it, right? And then all of a sudden everybody says, see, everybody's saying it. Well, yes, because everybody's repeating it. Why? Probably because it sold a bunch of books, right? And now they write their books because they want to sell a bunch of books too, right? You want to sell a bunch of books right now? You can write it on the, what is it? The Harbinger, the Shemitah, the Shemita, Shemita. There we go. Yeah. yeah. You want to sell a book? Put that on the title. It doesn't have to be inside. Just write that on the title. <laughs> It'll sell, Yeah. Why? Because people always do that, right? <laughs> Just give a definition inside or something. I don't know. It's a bit <clears throat> but whenever you have all these people that say the same thing, and all, you have to remember, all of the religious leaders of the day missed Jesus. They had their way of things, 
and they missed him. So one of the first things I do when I hear everybody saying something and they say, oh, this, this, this the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, here's who they are. Here's who, okay. When I hear that and everybody's saying it, have you heard this? Have you read that? Have you read I say, you know what? I know one thing for sure. That's not the way it's going to be. Why? Because it never is that way. God always works through a remnant. And usually it's a small group. Okay. Few there be that find it, not the mass. The mass are usually wrong. Why? Because they're looking for something rather than looking for truth. And so the first thing I usually do, I mean, I might read it and check it out, but usually I will discard it in the sense of, okay, when people start falling away from that and that gets down to a small handful, then I might listen and think they're more right. Why? Because the mass never knows the truth. Right? So that's an automatic thing I just do. Right? Recently I was reading in Ezekiel. Yeah. In Ezekiel, he talks about these, he said, I will send these, um, what is it? The, he names four things. And they are the same four things that are in the book of Revelation about the four horsemen. You've heard about the four horsemen? Okay. And these four things are those exact same things in Ezekiel. And he talks about when he's going to do it and how it's going to happen and gives you an exact layout of how each one of these things are coming into place. And yet that lines up exactly with the book of the Revelation and with Daniel. Daniel even talks about it. So it's pretty amazing. When you start looking, at it, I'm not spending a lot of time looking at this, but when it pops out at you, you tend to take notice, kind of like, hmm, that's interesting. And you keep on reading stuff that you can do. All right? So, that's what, well, they better not go there. Anyway. Uh, let's see. The main thing is that Jesus said people would know, and here's what we're going to do. The main thing is that people, Jesus said people would know we are his disciples by our love for one another, not by our end time viewpoint. Amen? That's important. Remember that. I don't care if you got all your prophetic scriptures lined up. If, you're, if you don't have love for your brother, you're still in darkness. Okay? John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you lo also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. One thing is sure, arguing about the end is not going to bring people to Christ. Amen? Yeah. So it's not arguing whatever viewpoint you believe. Let me, t let me put it this way. Make sure that the viewpoint you believe, that, make sure that it has the right result, which means bringing souls into the kingdom and helping grow them up so that they also know how to bring souls into the kingdom. Amen? Not just a healing ministry, not a deliverance ministry, but a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the world back into God, reconciling ourselves back to God, reconciling our minds to God, make sure that that's what we're doing and that our end time viewpoint should not stop that. Amen? Finally, point C. I know we're going over a couple of minutes here. Fruit that remains. And this is a big one. We're going to be talking about this part of the rest of the day too. John 15, 15 says, and this is Jesus, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends. Why? Because he couldn't call them sons at that point. Because they weren't born again. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You hear that? He told them everything. You hear that? Except what they couldn't bear. Remember what he said? He said, there's things I want to share, but I, you can't bear them yet. Okay? Verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you. Notice these things. Then he says that you love one another. That you love one another is not things, plural, it's one thing. So he's not talking about just loving one another. He's also talking about you having fruit that remains. These things I've commanded you, that you should have fruit and your fruit should remain. So the scripture is plain. We are, all, we are to go into all the world and bring forth fruit. I give you the scriptures. Not only are we to bring forth fruit, we are to bring forth fruit that remains. Now you will notice at the bottom of each one of these, I have a summary and I wrote action plan. Your job is to take these and what was said here and take it before God and say, okay, how can I do this? How, what's my part in this? And you write that out. Trust the Spirit of God in you to be able to speak to you and to be able to show you what you need to do. But don't just, when you get done, fold up the manual and say, oh, okay, well, that was interesting or whatever else. Go into it. Spend some time. 
Listen, we can't just go from teaching to teaching. That we have to assimilate this and have it into our lives as part of what, how we live. Amen? Now, go... Oh, no, there's more. There's one more page. Yep. I think it is. No, nope, a couple of pages. Oh, okay. I tell you what, we're going to go ahead and break now. Because if I don't, we'll, once I get started on this next part, we're going to... I'm not going to stop. Uh, <clears throat> at least for another 45 minutes. So, um, <clears throat> we'll stop here on page 18. And when we come back, we'll pick that up. So, we'll take a quick break. And then we'll be right back. All right?